Brussels today, haven't you? And we'll reflect a little bit later on in the programme about how the other NATO members responded to Trump's speech, telling them they've all got to pay a little bit more. But politics returned to some degree of normality today after the horrors of Manchester. Uh, and UKIP launched their manifesto this morning, uh, I guess in a way in defiance of the Manchester terrorist attack, and we are back uh, fighting a general election campaign. Uh, the manifesto was launched by uh, party leader Paul Nuttall. Uh, now, it'll be no secret to any of you that the last time UKIP launched a general election manifesto, it was me that was launching it. Um, and you may say, well, how on earth uh, can Nigel uh, present the UKIP debate uh, and do it as neutrally as he can. Well, I'll do my best, all right? Um, I, I, I will attempt to give no opinion. Uh, I, I tried not to do that so with the Liberals or the Greens or the Conservatives or Labour. Uh, so here goes. What did the UKIP manifesto say? It said they want to reduce net migration into Britain to zero over the course of the next five years. They want a five-year ban on low-skilled migrants coming into the country. On Brexit, uh, they want us to walk away from the table as soon as we possibly can, and they want to bring back the blue British passport. On multiculturalism, they want to stop the burqa being worn in public. And on policing, they want 20,000 new police on the streets. They want more money for the NHS uh, and extra money for social care. And how are they going to pay for it all? Well, they are proposing a radical cut in our foreign aid spending. Um, at the moment, we spend 0.7% of, of the economy on foreign aid. UKIP would reduce it to 0.2%. of a percent. And I think that, uh, in, in, in essence, are the main points of the manifesto, but with one added feature. The whole conference this morning, uh, the main theme that came out of it was a really very strong attack on Theresa May personally for her record as Home Secretary in terms of dealing with multiculturalism and the growth of terrorism. And I'm sure we'll get plenty of opinions as to whether that was the right, wrong, tasteful or not thing to do. So I'm asking you that with the launch of the UKIP manifesto, does it win your vote or not? And to get involved, you can call me on 0345 6060 You can text through your view to 84850. You, of course, can tweet using the hashtag Farage and LBC as LBC. And you can watch us live on LBC's Facebook page right now. And I'm going to Jonathan in Moulton, sub Hamden, which is down in deep in Somerset. Good evening, Jonathan. Hello. Hello, Nigel. Thanks for taking the call. Not a bit. So what did you think of the, of the UKIP manifesto? Um, I like what I see, and I saw it the uh, launch this morning. I don't think it goes far enough. And uh, something you said last night on air, yeah. um, I think, is starting to gain more traction in the media, not, the, um, not necessarily TV media, but um, something that Colonel Richard Kemp said and other people have said, uh, and you kind of knocked back a bit last night. Mm. The issue of internment of the three and a half thousand known troublemakers and jihadis that we currently have in the UK. Um, my feeling is that this is something we are going to have to cope with and, and confront at some point. Sooner rather than later, and the reason I say that is that because we are barely able to keep tabs on a, a small fraction of those three and a half thousand people, um, that's putting a massive strain on security forces. Um, surely if we detain them with a view to either deporting them if we can or permanently interning them if we can't deport them, um, that well, has to be a better solution than... Well, Jonathan, um, I mean... I mean Two quick points, Jonathan, there. I mean, firstly, um, yeah, it's not often people say, UKIP, don't go far enough. They should be a lot tougher uh, than they've been today, but you're suggesting that they should be. What Nuttall did say was that anybody that's been to Syria should not be allowed back into the country and should have their passport removed. He's very clear on that. Um, second point, OK, there are nearly, nearly 3,500 people on this suspected terrorist list, but as we also learn, uh, this Abadi creature who committed that atrocity, he wasn't part of the 3,500, but he was known to the authorities to be linked to bad people. So you're probably 
But if you listen to some of the experts, Jonathan, you're probably talking somewhere between seven and 10,000 people that you would need to intern. Are you, are, are you happy to go down that route? Well, given, given that had we detained 3,500 people who were on the, on, the, on the main list, that would have given us much more resource available to find people lower on the food chain, like a baby, because we wouldn't have had to monitor the people who were most at risk. So we unless, on the lower tier. unless, of course, Jonathan, the very active interning people has the effect that it had on the Irish nationalist movement, whereby you intern people, which leads to such public outrage at the unfairness of it, that you radicalise yet more people. Last question, Jonathan, for you. Um, part of what Paul Nuttall and his deputy chair, Suzanne Evans, said today is that the Prime Minister, Theresa May's record on actually delivering things was lamentable. You know, whether it was dealing with immigration, non-EU immigration over which she had real power, whether it was dealing with multiculturalism, uh, with division in society, with the growth of terrorism, the UKIP argument is that actually she's pretty weak and it needs a strong voice to make sure she actually does the right things. Do you think with that point that UKIP scored a hit? Yes. I do, definitely. And I think I would go further and I say all uh, leaders of all parties, apart from UKIP, uh, um, bear some responsibility uh, to, to a large or, you know, a larger or lesser degree. Um, yes, Suzanne Evans today, and, Suzanne Evans today, Jonathan, did say that she thought Theresa May bore some responsibility for what had yes. happened in Manchester. And that did lead uh, quite a lot in the media uh, to think she'd gone too far. Yes, I saw her being grilled on uh, Daily Politics by Andrew Neil, um, and um, I normally regard Andrew as a very fair commentator, but I think she came in for unjust criticism on that part, to be honest, because I, I sh firmly share the view that Suzanne Evans uh, put forward there, um, that because w we are facing these problems because of failures in public policy, they go all the way to the top of the leadership of all the parties. Well, certainly, th th that is a view, Jonathan, that is gaining ground. Jonathan, stay there, because I've got somebody here who might want to take you on with a different point of view. Morris in Edgware, good evening. Good evening to you. Uh, so you, you take a very different view, I understand. My view is double, treble the number of police. So what? what would that, how would that have stopped the terrorist doing what he did? Jonathan, res respond, was... Jonathan, respond to Morris. Morris says, even if you have more police, how would that have stopped the attack? I wouldn't necessarily disagree with Morris, uh, to be honest. Um, it's not so much a question of resource, but how, how the resource is used. And it goes, again, it goes back to the internment issue. If, if you remove the highest people in the, in the terrorist food chain um, from, from, the, um, from the public sphere, so to speak, then you can focus lower down the food chain. In terms, of, you, in terms of resources, yeah. So, Morris, yeah. there's the answer. Morris, the answer is... Can I, can I ask, can I make another comment? Please. All that time ago when ha uh, Hamza was spouting his vile uh, language in Finsbury Park... Yep. Why was he allowed to carry on? In the end, he was got rid of to the States. He could have been got rid of the moment he started. Ah. If you and I went out on the street, if we, you and I went out on the street and started spouting like that, they'd be locked up. Well, Morris, you're because absolutely... All the man, all the man be pan being, all the, we can't do this, we can't do that. If there was an epidemic, health epidemic, it'd start doing something about it. So the same thing here. This has got to stop this nonsense, allowing all these people to do it. It's all right to hear about human rights. What about humane rights? No, you make the point and very strongly. And in fact, when it came to uh, deporting Hamza and people like this, it took up to 10 years to get rid of these people from our shores. And why? Well, because of the European Convention on Human Rights, uh, which the Prime Minister, who says they're going to get tough on terrorism, has decided we're going to stay part of until, until 2025. Jonathan from Somerset, thank you. Morris, um, did you feel, I mean, you obviously feel very strongly on this issue, did you think UKIP got this right or wrong today in terms of their approach? Well, they, they feel they've got to do something. Mm -hmm. I don't know where they're getting their advice from, because as far as I'm concerned, many people, including you, Nigel, many people in politics don't know the ins and outs. They have to get advice from other people and then rubber stamp it later on. Yeah. Was, was I mean, did you feel that their criticism of Theresa May was tasteful 
or was appropriate in the circumstances? It's not appropriate. The only person to blame for anything is the person that perpetrated the, 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 um, the evil act, plus the people that taught him. Yeah, well, that's They're true. The but there is, also a, there is also a slight question, Morris, isn't there, that the authorities were informed five times that this guy could potentially be a danger. And perhaps, Morris, through lack of resources and personnel, they don't get round to dealing with all of the yeah, potential problems. Perhaps. The thing is, is, surely the people behind the scenes, the ones we don't see, they know what's going on. Why? Uh, where's all this advice coming from? Don't do this, don't do that. We can't touch this person, we can't touch that. Why not? Because I think... Actually, we've been a bit scared that if we were to act in a certain way, we might get called nasty things by the liberal mainstream media, Morris. I suspect it's to do with cowardice as much as anything else. Thank you, Morris, from Edgware, for your call. James in Stoke-on-Trent. Good evening, James. Hey, how you doing, mate? You all right? I'm doing all right. Yeah, so what did you think of the UKIP manifesto? Uh, to be honest, mate, I was going to vote Conservative because I could only support UKIP with you there, but I've completely changed my mind because that manifesto is literally utterly flawless, mate. There's wow. nothing wrong with that at all, is there? It's just pure common sense. OK, and you had... I mean, have you voted UKIP before, or...? No, no, I mean, to be honest, the only reason why I'm voting Conservative is because I think it would just be such a catastrophe to have Jeremy Corbyn in charge. So that's the only reason. I just thought a vote, like a vote for UKIP might be a vote for Labour. Do you see what I mean? So that's the only reason why I was giving it to the Conservatives. Mm -hmm. um, but this time I just thought, well, I think Conservatives probably are going to win, but I want their opposition to be you. I mean, I would rather, well, well, UKIP, I mean, I would rather yeah. UKIP lead the country, but the chances of them actually winning are slim. So I thought, well, seeing that Conservatives are probably going to win anyway, I thought I'd better give my vote to UKIP to try and give them the okay. big voice that they can, yeah. James, you've said it very clearly. Thank you. James thought it was flawless, and he's switching from the Conservatives to UKIP. I'm keen to hear from you. If perhaps you've gone the other way, or you agree with James, the election campaign started again today with the launch of that UKIP manifesto, and I'm asking you whether it wins your vote or not. I'm keen to hear any view on this. Well, Paul Nuttall today launched the UKIP manifesto, and amongst other things, they want a ban on low-skilled migrants for five years coming into this country. They want net migration reduced to zero within five years. They want big cuts to the foreign aid budget to give more money to the NHS and social care and another 20,000 police officers on our streets or busy fighting terrorism. Uh, and I'm asking you whether that manifesto wins your vote or not. There is one part of the manifesto that I don't think could ever have come into being if I'd stayed as leader. And it is the section dealing with the 2003 Licensing Act. Uh, where UKIP say that the cafe culture that Tony Blair thought he was bringing into the country back in 2003 has led to more drunkenness, has led to more violence, and UKIP would like new legislation which would limit the hours that pubs and bars would be open selling alcohol and would like fewer alcohol licences, which could mean fewer pubs on our high streets. That wouldn't have happened, would it, with me as leader? <laughs> right, <laughs> I'm going to go uh, to John in Belfast. John, what did you make of the UKIP manifesto? Good evening, how are you? I'm very well. Um, well, I thought, it was, I thought it was pretty good. I'm, uh, I'm a first-time voter. This is the first election I'll actually be allowed to vote in. Right. Um, and I'm seriously considering voting for UKIP. Um, but I'm, I just think at the moment they're being way too um, politically correct at the moment. You know, uh, talking about radicalism, extremism, and all of that, instead of addressing the fact that this violence comes from the religion of Islam itself. Um, it's, and, fun you know, it's, it's, it's funny, John, you say that, because, you know, the other parties, I, mean, I heard Emily Thornberry from Labour and others uh, who, who've been saying about UKIP in the last couple of weeks that actually the policy is disgusting because, <laughs> be, because UKIP want to ban the burqa or the niqab in public, um, and they want, and this is the controversial bit, uh, they want screening for girls at risk of female genital mutilation. So uh, the mainstream political class, John, think UKIP have gone too far already, but you're saying they should go further. Right, but that's because they're the mainstream political class. They, they don't reflect the attitudes of, you know, normal Englishmen or, or, or normal British people. I think they should really go after Theresa May on the fact that she said, for example, Sharia law is greatly beneficial for the UK. 
She's called Islam a great faith, which has nothing to do with all the recent terrorist attacks. She said that it was Islamism, not Islam, whatever that means. Um, so, yeah, I'd probably be willing to vote for UKIP if they propose something like a, like, like a Trump-style ban on any further immigration of Muslims. Because, you know, it's, it, right. unfortunately, well, it's the only solution. It's the only way. Even if it is 0.000, there's still, and this is how percentages work, the more you let in, the more terrorism you will have. You know, we have so many politicians here saying that if you demonize Islam, then we'll make, more Mus- we'll make Muslims hate us more. They're just so hypocritical. In one breath, they'll say that terrorism has nothing to do with Islam. In the next breath, they'll say that if you criticize Islam, then we'll be making more terrorists. So, John, I you, argue- you, I mean, I, I've yeah. always tried to draw a distinction myself with political campaigning that that actually the vast majority of Muslims living in Britain are not just law-abiding, but they're integrated, uh, and that what we do not need to do is to intact the entire religion, just the strains of it uh, that are causing these problems. But you think there's a more fundamental problem, clearly. I would argue that if the mere fact of addressing the problem honestly is enough to tip thousands of young Muslims over into jihad mode, then we are in a much more serious situation than we thought. Because when people talk about extremist, radical Islam, what they're really talking about is just conservative, orthodox Islam. Because, uh, you know... Yeah, we are, I mean, John, we mustn't get too theological, I think, tonight yeah, yeah, on this programme. But, but, but basically, you think UKIP's OK with its manifesto, but should have gone a bit further? Yes, I think that they need to be addressing this problem honestly. I think that they need to stop talking about Islamism and radicalism and all the other things and address the fact that this comes from the okay. Quran itself. It comes from the example of Muhammad. Um, stop being so squeamish about this, because the only political party that are willing to talk about this honestly, and they're not at the moment. I think it's, I think it's okay. tragic. John, thank you very much, John, for your call. That's the second caller tonight saying UKIP actually need to be a lot tougher than they're being. And your texts and tweets. Hello, Nigel. I don't want to talk on air. I don't know what they're frightened of. Uh, but I do want to say, I've read the UKIP manifesto. It's impressive. That's Gillian from Seven Oaks. After the awful events of this week, we could all do with some light relief. And UKIP's manifesto certainly makes us chuckle. I'm glad the party isn't being taken seriously anymore, says Andy. Uh, UKIP blames Mrs May, but we should blame Europe's no borders policy, uh, says Chris. And I'd like all the jihadi returners to lose their British passports and not be allowed back into the UK. And I'm going to Portugal, to Ruth. Good evening. Hi, Nigel. Can you hear me OK? I can, yes. So what did you make of the manifesto? OK, that's brilliant. Well, I've got a, qu- uh, a few questions for you first before I tell you what I make of the manifesto. Well, we haven't first got forever, but we haven't got forever, Ruth. But, but, but uh, you know, a couple, a couple of quick questions. Go on. I know. Well, first of all, quick question. Why would you want a blue passport? Uh, well, I, I personally want a passport with the words European Union taken off it. I want it to be a British passport. That is okay, what I... It's that not is, necessarily a blue passport, right? That is what I... Passport. Hang on, Ruth. You asked me the yeah. question. I'm going to answer. Yeah. That okay. is what I campaigned for all the way through the referendum. I kept whipping the passport out of my pocket and saying, I want this to be a British passport. I, I didn't actually, at any point, uh, personally say that I wanted it to go back to being blue. Um, and... The proposal that we should get that passport back, Ruth, isn't mine, it's UKIP's, OK? OK, so let me tell you something, OK? Because I'm originally from Israel and I did have a blue passport my whole life. Yeah. My children now are British citizens, OK? So I do care about what happens in the UK. I do care a lot, actually. I'm now a Portuguese citizen, so I do have a Burgundy passport, and that's the European Union. Mm. And I do think it does let you... It does give you a lot of freedom, which I didn't have before, okay? At first, regarding the blue passport. Then regarding the burqa, I think basically banning the burqa will just make the Muslims more likely to be victimized, whereas educating the Muslims, because I think most of the Muslims don't actually know what's in the Quran and what actually their religion is um, uh, reflecting. So let's say... Okay, I'm not. I'm not sure. I'm making myself very clear, but I think Islam is basically a reflection of Muhammad, and I don't think most Muslims are really aware of that. So instead of ban, uh, banning the burqa and saying, "Okay, you're not allowed to do this, you're not allowed to do that," you might as well educate every child in the UK on what every religion is 
including Islam, and that might be much more efficient than banning the burqa. Well, it might be, Ruth. I mean, I mean, UKIP's point, the point they're making with the burqa, with talking about Sharia courts, the point they're making is that everybody should have equal rights and be treated equally under the law, and UKIP say, allege, that there are many women living in Britain in uh, Islamic families who are not given the same rights as other women, and that's what they're talking about, Ruth. Well, British law should be the, role, the, the law that governs. Sharia law actually contradicts the law with British law. And I do not know why actually British courts allow this to happen. Well, but that's... that's a question. Well, in a sense, you're saying, Ruth, that you agree with that bit of the UKIP manifesto, but you're concerned about the passport, yeah? should not exist in Britain because Britain should have British law. But that's completely different than banning the burqa because if you're going to ban the burqa... That's a, a tiny bit that you're doing that's going to give the Muslims a lot to hmm. say that they're okay. being Okay, so, so given the pros and cons that we've discussed, what marks out of 10, Ruth, would you give the UKIP manifesto? Oh, God, that's a very difficult question. I don't know. <laughs> the blue passport gives it a, a, very, a very big minus because I think it limits you and it makes a statement that you're isolating yourself from the rest of the world. And that's based on my own experience as an Israeli with a blue passport. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that's based on my own experience now with a burgundy passport. It gives me so much more freedom as an individual. Okay, so I think it's a statement you should not do as a country that, that actually advocates for well, tolerance and. Well, Ruth, you can argue, you can argue about burgundy passports and freedom, but I would say this to you, Ruth, it's that that the British people voted against in the referendum last year. And I thank you very much for your call from Lisbon. Although the weather here is rather like Lisbon today. Um, I'm going to go to Corrie in Dartford. Corrie, what did you make of it? Hi, Nigel. How are you? I'm all right. First and foremost, my sincere condolences to all the people who lost their lives and the families of the people who lost relatives yeah. in the bombing. Well, we all share um, that, Corrie. Thank absolutely. you for all the work. I know, I agree. Thank you for all the work you've done with Brexit and to shine light on specific issues as somebody who's been only recently into politics because I'm only 21 yep. I had to look at different manifestos and to choose which type of policies I liked um, I think it manifesto mm -hmm. it basically shone light fundamentally on the NHS and the 11 billion a year is yep well, they, yeah, yeah, I mean, what is. they're talking about, they're talking about saving billions from the foreign aid budget, which they say yeah, we could yeah. spend on the yeah. NHS and social care. That's There's what they say. 0.2% of GDP they're proposing. They're proposing down from 0.7 to 0.2. That's absolutely right. Yeah, that, I think that was Obama's one. And also there was a study out in 2015, I think, which suggested that trade with the country is, is actually better than mismanaged spending on foreign aid. So I actually agree with Paul on that. Um... So I actually think the UKIP manifesto has some points which I would change. I don't think we can actually go around burning, banning, uh, banning burkas or banning the EU mm -hmm. flag because that's one of our libertarian style or liberal style traits. Um, but my the reason why I called though, even though I agree with some of the policies and disagree with some of the policies, is I'm wondering what UKIP's stance. And I think I know your stance because you know Rand Paul in America. But what UKIP's stance is on non-interventionism. Um, well, I think that UKIP, uh, mm -hmm. traditionally, uh, UKIP has said that, mil that military intervention is the last resort, and that is still very much the policy. OK, brilliant. OK, I just was wondering, do you have any questions for me? Yes, Corrie. Give it marks out of ten. I would give the updated policies about eight out of ten. I don't really like the Burqa ban, and I don't really like the EU flag ban. I can't really see how that... Okay. A liberal policy, but other than that, the NHS funding is fundamentally acceptable, and the actually zero point two percent of GDP for foreign aid. People will no, think that. Corey, we're Corey, you've, you've 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 run out of time, man. I thank you very much indeed for your call. Yeah, and you keep promising money for the NHS. Other parties too promising extra money for the NHS, but nobody else promising to radically cut the foreign aid budget. You're listening to the Nigel Farage Show exclusively on LBC. It's an election campaigning resumed today with NATO with the uh, UKIP launching their manifesto. But the other thing that tickled me today is Donald Trump has been in Brussels today. Now, not the sort of city where you'd think he'd necessarily get the best of responses. And he went to the NATO headquarters, brand new 
NATO headquarters. Big, shiny building that's cost about a billion euros to build. And he gave a speech. He said that only five of the 28 NATO members were actually paying the membership fee the club demands, which is that people spend 2% of their economy on defence. Um, and you can see that speech. Um, it's there on LBC's website. But what is delicious are the faces of the other leaders, as Trump is saying. It's not good enough. And basically, you owe us massive amounts of money. If you want to laugh, have a look. Trump was not holding back in Brussels today. And I have to say, I 100% agree with him. I think if you're in a club and it is a mutual defence pact, as NATO has been for all these years, and if you want it to develop, to perhaps work together to deal with radical jihadi terrorism and other things, people have got to pay their way. He also today met with Donald Tusk and my old friend Jean-Claude Juncker. And there is a photograph of them sitting together in a meeting room, uh, not exactly looking comfortable, being in each other's company. We don't as yet know anything about that conversation. But what is interesting is that Juncker's line, when it comes to NATO and defence, is to say, we shouldn't be bullied by the Americans. There's no need to spend 2% on defence, because we're going to have our own bright, shiny, new European army. And I'm guessing at some point before too long, we will uh, reports will filter out as to what was actually said in that meeting. But yesterday, as we talked about Salman Abedi, we talked about some of the motivations that perhaps were behind uh, what he did in killing all of those people... Um, I raised the point, and it was that once again, here was somebody who was a frequent and heavy cannabis smoker. Do you remember I said this last night? Well, if you go through and you look back, you see that Jihadi John, remember him? The guy that was beheading people. Uh, again, a heavy, regular cannabis smoker. You look at the uh, guys that murdered Lee Rigby in the streets of London. Again, regular, repeated, heavy cannabis users. You look at the Tunisian beach killer who killed 30 people last year, a regular, heavy cannabis user. And you know something? The list, Richard Reed, the shoe bomber, the list goes on and on and on. It, I, to me, it seems, to be fair, it seems almost impossible that there isn't somehow a link of some kind. Now, I know very little about this, about the effect that perhaps regular uh, y use of cannabis or other drugs can have on people's minds. And to help me uh, this evening, I've got Dr Robert uh, Lefevre, who is an addiction specialist, a former GP and author of Kick Your Habit. Robert, good evening. Good evening. Good evening. So, so tell me, Robert, I, I literally know very little about this at all, but what is it that repeated cannabis use does to people's view of reality? Well, the thing it does in particular is to damage mood, memory, and motivation. The mood is all over the place. They may still think intellectually straightforwardly, but their moods go up and down totally unpredictably. Their memory is unreliable. They can't remember what they said last time. And so to try to make out that they're completely up to speed, they make it up. And the third thing, motivation. They easily prey to people saying, this is what you need to do, this is the way you need to think, this is the way you need to behave, because they're losing all sense of personal self-esteem and motivation. So mood, memory and motivation are the things that mm. uh, are particularly damaged, and that can cause absolute havoc, as you, as you rightly have, have drawn attention to. The funny thing is, Robert, I, I kind of thought that people that smoked pot on a regular basis were sort of like sort of laid back and half asleep. And yet, is it possible that this drug or perhaps others can lead towards violent thinking or behaviour? It can do. But you're quite right that cannabis usually sends, gives people the munches. They start eating crazily and they fall asleep. But... If you're, what you're talking about here in, in your summary was heavy, regular use. Yes. That becomes a major drug and has major effects on the brain. After all, 
the brain is a chemical substance. It's a physical chemical substance. And it is affected by physical chemical things. We damage our brain when we use mood-altering substances and processes. And I, I personally you know, haven't used any mood altering substance for the last 32 years. But my life now is so much happier than it ever was. Previously, I looked for magic fixes. I wanted something out there to fix the emptiness that I felt in here. Nowadays, I don't feel empty in here. I have a wonderful life with my wife and with my writing and my counseling work. And I, I you know, I'm so happy. I could not believe my luck. Mm. Well, there's, there's an awful lot of people out there a lot of people out there, Robert, who, who, who it, it seems are being, uh, regardless whether it links directly to terrorism, but whose lives are being wrecked by this stuff. What, what are, you know, for concerned parents, perhaps, listening to this show, you know, what are the, what are the signs that people should look for in terms of, well, dru- in terms of drug misuse? In cannabis, in cannabis, it damages mood, memory and motivation. Yep. People do not achieve in the way they did before. They change their friends. They change their activities. With cocaine, you get a paranoia. You, you think you're being followed and, and threatened all the time. With acid, you think you've got supernatural power. Uh, this is why people taking LSD uh, believe sometimes that they can fly and they mm. jump off high buildings and, and actually kill themselves. With speed, amphetamines, well, it, it speeds you up. And they uh, start talking, gabby, 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 and it, it doesn't make any sense. So those are the things that are specific to those drugs. But with all drugs, they cause poor judgment. Mm. So I say, intellectually, they may still be okay, but their feelings are all, all over the place. They see enemies as friends and friends as enemies. The people who are giving you the drugs are the greatest friends ever. And the people trying to help you to get off them are your greatest enemies. And so what happens is that you change your values and change your relationships. And you need help from other people who've been there and understand it from inside. And that's what I try to do, because my previous addiction you know, made me a, a crazy man. <clears throat> but I'm not now. I, I, yeah. you, know, you sound, you sound incredibly. In fact, you sound laid back beyond belief and very happy with your life. Robert, thank you very much for giving us that brief. I really do appreciate it. Interesting, isn't it, what he said about how you sort of divide the world up and, and your friends become your enemies and your enemies become your friends. I, I can't put any more science folks into it, but there does seem to be some very, very strong link between these young men who, who smoke a lot of cannabis and then get involved in terrorism. I know what the word for them is. Trump used it the other day, didn't he? Losers. Right, we're back to UKIP. The manifesto launch, uh, some big ideas and some strong criticism, very strong criticism of the Prime Minister Theresa May's record as Home Secretary, which some thought was distasteful. The idea that she bore some responsibility for Manchester. Uh, many uh, in the journalistic class thought UKIP had gone too far. On Facebook, Keith says to me, as much as I'd like them, UKIP can't win this time round. Russell says UKIP's job is to remind the people that there are millions that wanted Britain back. Colette says, don't get into the game of making excuses for these terrorists. I wasn't aware that I did. Um, and I get on Twitter, P.S., I will vote Labour. The best option in a bad bunch. Well, fine. But it's UKIP we're talking about. And we're going to the Ronda, to Ian. Ian, good evening. Good evening, Nigel. What did you make of the UKIP manifesto? Um, dangerous, reactionary, divisive. Um, people should be very um, fearful, I think, of, uh, of, the, of what UKIP is saying at the moment. What, Ian, just, I mean, OK, I mean, we've had callers on tonight saying it doesn't go far enough, and you're saying it goes way too far. Can, can you just sort of pick out one thing from that UKIP manifesto launch today that you think is actually dangerous? Well, I think the whole um, pitch of, of UKIP is to scapegoat uh, minorities. And, and in this occasion, um, UKIP is scapegoating um, Muslims. Is and it? And I just think that that is unhelpful. Okay, um, what well, do you say? Banning the burqa, banning the burqa, for example. Yeah, well, that's very mainstream now, Ian, isn't it? I mean, the French have done it, and yeah. uh, the Belgians have done it, and there are other European countries on the verge of doing it. I mean, this is a very mainstream thing now. Well, it doesn't seem to have helped um, the French in terms of uh, attacks. It doesn't seem to have helped the Belgians. You know, we've got to, if we're going to stop 
terrorism, we need to look at the root cause of the problem. Yes, and Ian, UKIP would argue that one of the whole points of their manifesto today and their campaign over the last few weeks is that they have an integration agenda. As opposed to state-sponsored multiculturalism, which has divided societies, they want to bring people together so that we all live under the same law. No, in, in UKIP, UKIP is, 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 has got nothing to do with integration. UKIP is about excluding people whose skin is a different colour Oh, that's a new one. Man in the UK. I thought it was Eastern Europeans we hated. Now, <laughs> I mean, you know, Ian, OK, I get it. You're not a UKIP supporter. And this manifesto probably makes you dislike UKIP even more because in some ways they've said things that are much stronger uh, than perhaps I said back in 2015. Ian, I thank you very much for the plight way in which you did your best to tear the UKIP manifesto to pieces. Uh, Right now, you're listening to the Nigel Farage Show. It's UKIP launching their manifesto today, resuming the general election campaign. Just to remind you, I'm not here to campaign for the party. I'm here to invite your view on what you think of that manifesto and whether it makes you more or less likely to vote for them. Exactly the same as I did with the Conservatives, Labour, Lib Dem and Green manifesto launches. Paul in Lewisham, what did you make of that manifesto launch? Uh, I, I just wanted to like talk about the burqa thing, really. Uh, that's yeah. the bit that concerns me. I mean, I don't think banning a burqa is a good idea or a bad. I don't think it's going to achieve anything. Because in this country, when when like, all the good things that the Muslims do, nobody ever talks about. Like, we've got the Shard building, and the guy who owns the Harrods, the same guy, Al Maktani, the owner of Qatar, yeah. when he put that big, big structure up and created jobs for our people... Nobody talks about that. They was all boasting about, oh, yeah, mate, I was home by three o'clock. Everyone's getting paid and feeding their families. No one wants to know. No one, no one says, oh, thanks to the Arabs or the Muslims for all the, all the good things. They do. Everyone talks about the negative stuff as soon as something goes wrong. Well, I think... The burqa, yeah. the burqa. I mean, what's that going to be? If you fancied... If you was walking down in a club and you saw a girl with ginger hair and you didn't like her, you don't have to sleep with her. You're not going to sleep with a woman with a burqa, so why does it concern you so much? Oh, well, I suppose it would concern people because you wouldn't know, you wouldn't actually know, Paul, whether it was a woman or a man. Um, and, yeah, we and, 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 hang on, hang on, hang on. Um, and in an age when we are increasingly worried about security and terrorism, remember that one of the London tube bombers uh, all those years ago escaped by wearing a burqa. So there is perhaps a strong security argument for saying people should not cover their faces. Oh, fair enough. I don't know what, what I can say about it. I didn't realise you'd escaped by mm. wearing a burqa, but that was a long time ago. And these yeah. new terror attacks that we've had recently, they had nothing to do with a burqa. And it's just, I don't know, it's, it's a step backwards. We need to be more creative. If we, I mean, take Modi from, you know, president of India. Yeah. When the, when the attacks happened in India, he said, these are not Muslims. These are like the people, you know, when, when there was a backlash, when people started turning on each other, he said the, the Muslims in India are not Muslims. They are our Muslims. And he did whatever he could. He gave them free laptops or whatever and tried to do what he could to build bridges now, we need to be more creative. I'm not saying give laptops to a load of Muslims. I'm saying maybe we should be saying to the rest of the world, our Muslim community is our Muslims, and we are, you know, we we've got to think outside the box. Rather than putting hate on top of hate, we could open fertility clinics. We could say, look, create our own new Muslim race, for example, you know, well, I don't think we're. I, I don't think we're going to get into that sort of um, uh, eugenics. But, but Paul, was there anything in the UK manifesto you thought was attractive and appealing? Well, I, I don't know. It's always the same. I don't, they're like, like everyone else says. It's, uh, it's you know, it's, uh, everyone's a bit weak, isn't they? So you know, you got. To, tell me something, Paul. Are you going to vote? Are you going to vote for anybody, Paul? I'm going to vote, but I'm drawn between the Communist Party and um, Labour. OK, well, OK. I'm not going to comment on that, because I'll get myself into terrible trouble. But I think you'll find that the Communist Party are actually not standing in this election because they're supporting Jeremy Corbyn. I think I'm right in saying that. Paul from Lewisham, I thank you for your call. Um, I get a Lisa in Barnet. Lisa, good evening. Oh, good evening, Nigel. Nice to speak with you. Thank you for everything you've done. I just think it's a terrible mistake 
for you, Kip Manifesto, to just say ban the burqa. It should be ban face coverings because I want to see people's faces. If they're on a protest meeting or wherever they are, I need to see their face. And I think it's singling out, and that's what's causing problems. Yeah, I mean, what they say in the manifesto is they ban people in public from wearing the niqab or the burqa uh, because the, the, the party says they are dehumanising. Hmm. But the, the, I, I'm against the burqa, and I'm against them, but I think it would be more sensible to have banning face coverings because okay. I don't want to see it at, at protest meetings either. If I met you, I don't want to see you with your face covered. I want to see you. I want to look in your eyes. I want to look at your mouth. We can talk to each other. That's what's behind that, and that's why I'm so against the burqa. Okay, so you think basically you keep a right, but they've got the language wrong. I think that's absolutely right. Lisa, you've made your point absolutely clearly and beautifully. I thank you. Uh, George, in Tooting, what do you make of the UKIP manifesto? Uh, love your show. Um, um, I have one little problem with yes. the, the UKIP manifesto, and that is the bit where it's um, saying that it wants to um, withdraw from the uh, Paris Climate Change Agreement yep. because it has no basis in science. And, you know, I kind of get that, you know, you, um, um, climate uh, sort of fits with academia and sort of, you know, the liberal elites. But the science is very clear that climate change is, is happening and it ha has an absolute solid base in science. So I think that point is that it has no base in science is fundamentally dishonest. I think that uh, I mean, one of the arguments here, uh, George, is that uh, UKIP are saying that they would remove... VAT from domestic energy bills, and they would scrap green levies, which uh, doing those things uh, would save people, the average household, about £170 a year. And I think the argument is that, is it climate change? Is it global warming? I mean, UKIP is very sceptical about all of this, and you clearly have a problem with that. Um, I, I totally, I, yeah, I completely understand that, but to actually say that it has no basis in science when the body of evidence is so overwhelming is dishonest. Well, there are more scientists that say that increases in CO2 are leading to higher temperatures than the other way, but actually, George, there are also scientists who say it makes virtually no difference. And, and um, but basically, but your, the manifesto so says there is no basis it in does. science, which is fundamentally dishonest, and that, that's really my point. OK, George, no, nope, you've made your point. Thank you very much indeed. And my last call of the evening is going to be Mike in Norwich. Mike, good evening. Hi, Nigel. How are you doing? I'm doing very well, thank you. And you? Uh, yeah, not too bad, not too bad. I would say I'll try and get through this as best as I can because I'm a little nervous, you know. Oh, don't be nervous. Just spit it out, man. Spit it out. Tell me what you think. Go on. Um, I agree with most of it. Yep. Um, I'd probably give it 9 out of 10. Yep. Um, I would say my partner and I have voted for our local UKIP candidate already, uh, Dave Morland. Um, well, I can't go into constituencies or anything no, like that. that, that um, that's fine. Like... Um, I don't agree with abolishing the House of Lords. Uh, I think it needs serious reform. I uh -huh. think the numbers need to fall. Uh, and I think they could scrap the 300 quid... Uh, per day allowance. I mean, really, does Alan Sugar need three hundred pound a day? Yeah, fine. Um, well, you keep a bit. I mean, you keep a radical on that. They, they now want to get rid of the House of Lords. Was that? Yeah. Uh, what was the best bit of the manifesto, Mike? Uh, the best bit. I mean, I, I, I actually joined because of the education uh, okay. policies uh, in twenty fifteen. I mean, I graduated in teaching in two thousand and eight, um, and I. At the end of the day, a teacher's there to teach. They're not there to be a social worker, to be an administrator, to be, mm. you know, God knows how much else. So. Sure. But, Mike, and Mike, we're out of time, I'm sad to say, because I know you're a first-time caller, and I hope you do call again. Um, but basically, your position is that you're sticking with UKIP at this general election. Oh, yeah. Lovely. Mike... Thank you very much. Well, lots of opinions there. Mike is a UKIPper who's sticking with them. Uh, we had one person who was going to vote Tory, like what Nuttall had to say is going to vote UKIP. Others who are very worried, who don't like face coverings in any way at all. Um, others who are concerned um, that UKIP aren't with uh, the climate change lobby. Uh, I'll give one opinion on this, which is I think it was absolutely right 
for UKIP today to go ahead with their manifesto launch. Yes, what happened in Manchester on Monday was appalling, but the point of what happened in Manchester is they want to stop our democratic process. We want it to continue, all of us. You've been listening to The Nigel Farage Show. 